If you're trying to build a new skill, this episode is for you. This episode will help you to figure out what to practice, how to plan that practice, and how to get the most out of that practice. Ultimately, this will save you time, energy, and money so that you can build skills as quickly and fluently as possible. Part one, selection. You wanna take these projects one at a time or have a lovable project. And this is for many reasons, but one is due to something called negative transfer. So often some skills are so similar to others that they can actually negatively affect the way that skill goes. So if you had a French exam, you wouldn't want to study Italian right before. Or if you were going out to play golf, you wouldn't want to swing a baseball bat before you step up to the tee. That's negative transfer, and that's something that needs to be avoided. So that's why you want to pick one project at a time from a a motor skill type perspective, but also for your frustration, your emotions. If you're doing several different skills and you're hitting barriers with those different skills all at the same time, it's going to be hard to tease apart what to work on next to make sure that you're overcoming your frustrations with a given skill if you have so many. And the greatest barrier to skill acquisition is emotion, but emotion is also a great tool. So remember to try to harness your emotions throughout the process by honoring the fact that frustration will affect your emotions and consequently affect your skills. But at the same time, remember that you can harness your emotions by picking a project that you feel an emotional connection to and then working in accordance with that emotional connection so that you will be excited to go practice even if it's hard. And this is something that came up in this book, The First 20 Hours by Josh Kaufman. He talks all about honoring your emotional connection to a project. And he has some amazing things in here where he talks about different skills that he learned in just 20 hours of practice. And then also Stephen Kotler's book, The Rise of Superman, talks about emotion and flow states. And there's a bit of a feedback loop with that as well. So when we have experiences and memories, if there's strong emotion attached to that experience, that memory, then that emotion can act almost like a tag that's going to mark that memory and make it stronger, which is really great for being able to retrieve that memory later. And if you have a flow state, That's a set of positive emotions that feels incredible when you're in flow practicing something or executing something. And so that can reinforce your learning and it'll make you want to keep coming back. It becomes a positive addiction to get into flow when practicing and it reinforces your memory as well. But so much of that is linked to your emotions. So you want to acknowledge those when you're practicing your skill. The next thing you want to do is set a target performance level and You might wonder, how do you set a target performance level in something you're not good at? And the answer is in just determining what good enough looks like. And a quote from Charles Kettering on this would be that a problem well stated is a problem half solved. That's what we're trying to get here. We're trying to get that part of the solution in just figuring out what the problem really is and stating it well. So to define your sense of good enough, consider what it might take to hit a level in performance that's currently a little bit out of reach but not impossible. From there, you might want to lower the bar even further to find an intermediate goal that you can enjoy as uh, kind of an easy win along your path to the target performance level. So when I learned to salsa dance, I set a target performance level as follows. I said, by this date, I will go to a social dance, dance with a partner I've never danced with before, while keeping to the rhythm of the music for the entire song and executing five movement combinations five transitional moves, and two shines. And that beginner's level of target performance actually requires a lot of technical understanding. If you don't dance, you probably don't even know what a lot of those terms mean. So for this reason, while you are defining the target, you must also build some fundamental understanding of the subskills that comprise your desired skill. So grasp the necessary subskills. This means that to select the right things to work on, you must understand enough to distinguish the worthwhile from the wasteful. And this sort of learning isn't actually building the skill, but it is important. Learning will help you to make your training oriented to your skill and inform your ability to self-correct. So you can do some research, but don't get bogged down with spending lots of time doing just research because you're going to need that time for practice. So for many skills, there are books or videos that already exist that have condensed things down to prime you on the basics. And then for other skills, it may be helpful to speak directly with experts. So in Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Chef, he talks a lot about expert interviews, which is something that he gets to do through his huge podcast, as well as just something that he probably did even before that. But there are a few things to keep in mind that he points out with expert interviews. 
One of those is that a good performer does not necessarily equal a good teacher. So Michael Jordan might not be the best basketball coach. And another thing to keep in mind is that materials beat methods. If you are thinking about what material you want to learn, it could be, for example, in learning a language that you could learn thousands of words, and that could be helpful in a way, but it would be better to have material that's going to give you a list of the most useful words to you and the situation. And then let's take it even further. Let's say you are going to a particular region or country, and then you want the words that are most useful in the way that people speak there. So getting that material honed down carefully can actually beat having a great learning method where you learn material that's useless. When you have learned enough to grasp the relevant subskills for your target performance level, then just make a decision about your target and move on. And that's, that's the 80-20 principle. That's trying to pick that 20% of all that you could do that's going to get you 80% of the results. That's what we're aiming for in this definition of the target performance level. As you move from study to practice, you'll begin to develop mental models to guide you through the transition from your clunky initial training to more fluent execution of your skill. And one method for developing these models is inversion or imagining the worst case scenario. So by recognizing what you don't want to experience, you can add the necessary subskills to avoid that situation in your training. So for example, if you're learning a language and you realize that it would be difficult to get lost in a conversation, then you can learn the phrases that might help you to ask clarifying questions in that language. Or if you're doing something physically dangerous, so Josh Kaufman talks about going kite surfing in the first 20 hours, learning the skills that will prevent you from getting killed, the things that are going to save you from extreme danger is going to be very useful to you. Another lesson from the first 20 hours is uh, Kaufman's model for how he learned guitar, which I think shows the value of these models. So we'll compare this to how I learned guitar. When I learned guitar, I just went in and I would find very detailed documents online that would explain note by note what something was on the guitar. And then I would get on the guitar that I didn't really understand. And I would just start to try to pick out those notes with my hands. And after a week of practice, I might only have a few seconds worth of guitar playing figured out, and it wasn't satisfying, and I didn't stick with it. Kaufman's method was really the reverse. I was starting with very small, detailed pieces and aiming to someday play a whole song. He, on the other hand, knew that he had some strength in music already because he had a singing background. So what he did was he first just practiced singing along with the song without the guitar. Then he used that as his foundation to then go and practice by just hitting major chord changes the song while he was singing along. So his, his skill was already the foundation. Then he added just the chord changes. Then he added more intricate pieces over that. So each time he could play through the song and it was satisfying to him, but it was working from the place of his strengths and then getting to finer and finer detail and layering more and more complex skills on top of the easier skills for him. And that's obviously been more effective for him. I don't play the guitar anymore. So that tells you a lot. There are all kinds of research ideas about learning skills. One that's been around for probably 50 years is uh, Fitz and Posner's three stages of motor learning as the cognitive stage, the associative stage, and the autonomous stage. So the cognitive stage for a tennis player would be something like, just how do I hold the racket? You're really thinking deliberately about what you're doing. And it's in the, the most basic of skills. So you have to think about every component of what you do. In the associative, associative stage, you start to get down to um, things in chunks, really. So instead of thinking about every detail, now you're thinking, okay, my serve is the throw, the swing, and the follow through. You still have to concentrate and remember, I got to follow through on that serve, but the chunks are bigger now. You can start to deal in, in bigger volumes of things, but there's still going to be some thought and some problem solving required to execute the movements. In the autonomous stage, that's where, again, for the tennis player, all the movements, all the, the sub skills are essentially automatic now, and they can start to see the bigger picture. So they can start to think about where is my opponent? Um, what's my next shot? What's coming my way? And they can anticipate things and they can picture things on a much bigger level and kind of get out of themselves and their immediate need to execute the skill. So those can be stages that you can think about things in. Often you'll get in some skills all the way to the automatic level, the autonomous stage, but then you'll have to take it back to go and refine something. So even the best actors, the best golfers, they often will undo some of their methods, work with a coach, refine their swing, refine their skills, and then go back to a new level where they're automatic with a different style. You also want to know your skill type, and there are many different axes along which to divide your skill types, but knowing 
down to a very fine level, what type of skill you're doing will guide your selection and practice process. So one way of dividing skills is closed skills and open skills. Closed skills are things that you can learn through just basically just raw repetition. You just go and do it several times and then it becomes automatic. But often these skills don't really give you a big advantage in what you're doing. Eventually other people could catch up because the system of learning it is so rote. And then once you have it, it's just one way. So for example, a child who learns to walk a few days or weeks or months even ahead of the normal developmental schedule, while that might seem like they're learning something fast, it's a closed skill. So eventually everyone else will catch up. So learn if you're aiming for something that's a closed skill or an open skill, which would be something that's going to give you an advantage in the long run. It's going to be more ambiguous, uh, but it's going to be advantageous over time, even though it's a slower process. And these are the skills that if you're aiming to have high value skills, these are the ones that would be most valuable because they're going to give you that advantage over the long run rather than something that anybody can pick up. Other skill divisions are meant rather than to establish the value of the skill to guide your approach to building the skill. So this is the importance of labeling what I call the consistent circuit versus flexible circuit skills. A consistent circuit skill that's something like violin, golf, gymnastics, these depend on a foundation of technique to reliably recreate the fundamentals of the ideal performance. So in violin or in gymnastics, you come up to the situation and it looks essentially the same in, in the environment each time, and then you execute things your way. But a flexible circuit skill, these are things like soccer, stand-up comedy. These have to be fast and flexible. You go out on the soccer field and people are in a different position every time. So in this situation, you need to create options. You need to overcome varied obstacles. And you need to do them quickly. So a flexible circuit skill, that can work well actually when self-taught because you get all that exposure. So that's another division the flexible circuit and the closed circuit. And in Range by David Epstein, a great book and someone who I've had on my podcast, he talks about understanding the skill environment and how important that is. So there are different environments. There's the kind environment and the wicked environment. And in the kind environment, this is again like golf. This is something where you show up and you get to set your position around the ball and you get to execute essentially the same swing without any impediment you get to take your time, you get, you get to do it your way. So you have this kind environment that allows you to be in control of the situation. But a wicked environment would be something, again, like tennis, where you come and then you get your partner hitting the ball back to you. You never know what's coming next. The value of dividing these different environments is that it can guide your practice. And in David's case, it also sets up the model for his theory on why people should develop different skills. So when he says you should specialize late in his book, then people immediately would refer back to Tiger Woods and say, well, Tiger Woods started learning golf when he was something like two years old and he became the greatest golfer ever. So we should all specialize when we're two years old, but Tiger Woods is playing golf, which is a kind environment skill there. It does make sense because you get to control your situation. But the counter example is Roger Federer, who is probably the Tiger Woods of tennis and Roger Federer did not specialize on tennis until he was in his late teens. He played other sports and then he came to that. And David would say that that foundation of trying other sports, one, allowed Roger Federer to find out what he was best at. And two, allowed him to bring different models, different skill sets to his tennis that ultimately made him a stronger, more well-rounded athlete and tennis player in a sport that is a wicked environment where you need to be more rounded. You need to be able to approach things with many different models and to be able to react in the moment. So that's the value of defining the environment of your skill. Is it a kind environment skill? Is it a wicked environment skill? It's somewhere in the middle. Daniel Kahneman in Thinking Fast and Slow, another great book, he talks about how in his work, he was primed to try to figure out a test to figure out what would predict the success of military officer candidates. And they thought that they had developed this great test and that would really predict the outcomes. But what they found was that their test was actually not useful at all in predicting the success of military officers. And this can be attributed to a few things, but one is that environment. The career of a military officer can be so widely varied that to try to predict that, to try to understand where that person's going to go over 10 years of life and events and changes 
is near impossible. And your feedback loop, if you're trying to build a test that's going to get better, is so slow. How can you get feedback on something where you really don't know if someone has hit their stride for 10 years? It's just too long to assume that you could actually figure that out without more frequent feedback cycles. So use these distinctions to label your desired skill. Then plan to hone your practice to the unique demands of the situation. So is your skill a closed skill? Then perhaps you should just plan to rapidly amass identical practice situations. Are you learning a flexible circuit sport like soccer? Then maybe it's best to practice in multiple groups to be exposed to different styles and different skill levels. Is your environment a wicked environment? Then you would want to learn to take feedback with a grain of salt because you can't really take one event in a wicked environment as a, as a useful data point. You need more of a set. And then you'd want to see your progress on a larger trajectory rather than just day-to-day -day results. Those are different ways to use these different axes to divide your skills and then to better inform your practice and your approach to taking feedback. When you figured all that out, then you want to plan for the process. So you've done the upfront work of researching the skill, stretching yourself to understand it, identifying mental models, talking to experts, doing that inversion model, knowing your skill type. And now it's time to refine your plan for specific practice. Part two, schedule. We need to think about acquiring skill versus learning. So bear in mind that learning about a skill is not the same as building the skill. Learning can take you in a number of directions and help you to develop a great knowledge base without ever actually practicing the skill and getting better. So you can learn about many things that you will never get a chance to practice. You could learn about historical events, but this is developing knowledge about something. Usually in our society, it's to pass a test. This is popular in many education systems to learn about something and then take a test, but that actually clouds our expectations about developing real skills. So passing tests about hockey is a long way from being able to skate. And we need to make that distinction when we're tempted to just be learning rather than practicing. And on my podcast, skill acquisition and learning, those phrases are often used interchangeably, but the idea is to concentrate on amassing practice, the changes, the circuitry of your nervous system, your mind and body, and makes you a different, more capable person to be a better practitioner of your skill. So this is learning to do a unique thing. And it generally requires very specific and costly testing by experts if you actually wanted to be tested on it. This isn't something that a scalable system like a multiple choice exam will actually work for. That, that's not effective for examining something like someone's stand-up comedy ability or someone's tennis serve. So traditional learning like that should only be a small portion of your process. However, it can be worthwhile if it helps you to practice intelligently and to be able to self-correct in your own practice. Learning what makes practice well-oriented can be extremely valuable for saving energy, time, and money. To do this, research the sub-skills you identified by reading some articles, skimming a few books, or examining specialized materials, but do not spend many hours taking courses over weeks that could be spent practicing. Again, you want to amass the practice. That's the illusion of learning to go out and just uh, accumulate stuff. That's like buying running shoes when what you should be doing is going out and putting in miles to train for a marathon. So take charge of your own learning and motivation rather than passively perusing a book. Instead, if you're going through a book, search for themes and principles, look for common mistakes, and remember that this is to serve your skill building, not to pass a test. Now, up to this point, you'll have been in a long phase of learning about your project, choosing it, focusing on that one thing, selecting the elements to deconstruct, and learning more about those elements. And with your refined understanding, you can now go back and improve your deconstruction to better allocate the hours of practice ahead of you. So you, as you go through that process, you are better able to go back to look at the things that you picked in the beginning and make those even more attuned to your specific needs. And back to the four hour chef, Tim Ferriss talks about this on page 43 of the hard copy, but he talks about some specific questions that you could learn if you're doing an expert interview to make sure that you are getting the most out of your practice once you have enough understanding to kind of speak to an expert. So here are some great example questions from the four hour chef. You could ask who is good at this despite not being inclined to it in terms of their physical abilities. Who were the most controversial or unorthodox successes in this field? 
who are some of the lesser known teachers? What makes you different? What was an influence on you as you were learning this skill? What are the biggest wastes of time? That's a really good one to single out. What are the biggest myths and mistakes? What is your favorite instructional resource? And if you were to train me for four weeks with a million dollars on the line, what would you do to make sure that I succeeded? So when you ask those questions, then you've got someone who's been through the filter of thousands of hours of practice at this skill and knows the answers to those questions in a way that you wouldn't and that you probably couldn't even pick up from a book. So take that information, but do not plan to imitate experts completely because you and your situation will be unique. So you'll need to fine tune it to yourself. Next, we want to lay out the plan. At this point, you have decided what you want to be able to do, removed emotional barriers to developing that ability, deconstructed to subskills, and learned enough about each subskill to practice intelligently and self-correct in practice. Now you decide exactly how you want to spend your hours practicing the most important subskills while removing the barriers to that practice. Along the way, you may be tempted to pick up new projects. Don't do that. Remember to ignore other pursuits. The impediment to your learning process is not talent, but emotions like boredom, panic, insecurity, and frustration. So just remember, it is not talent that makes the skill, but time that serves as the magic ingredient. Lean on your memories of developing skills in the past and getting really skilled at something to overcome these emotional barriers, even when you're tempted to abandon something and go try a different path. Again, back to the first 20 hours by Josh Kaufman, he actually recommends pre-committing 20 hours of skill training so that you can't just back out on it. So that you'll already put it in your calendar. Once you've made your commitment, I'm gonna reach this target level and I'm gonna practice one hour a day at 5 p.m. for the next 20 days so that you will amass your 20 hours of practice and it's already laid out and you won't go and change your plan because it's already built into your schedule. You've already pre-committed to that 20 hours of practice. And when you are arranging your subskills and your practice, you wanna think in terms of what you already are good at so that you can set it up to get those early wins and to be making progress on things that will work for you. Again, working with your emotions, basically. What's going to be the least frustrating jump that you can first overcome, and then you can build on that and build on that rather than going for the hardest part and maybe feeling like you're never going to hit that skill. We have to talk about practice in terms of whether it should be batched together or spread apart. And this is something that people might tell you, oh, you gotta, you gotta get all your practice in at once, you gotta batch it. Other people would say, oh, you wanna spread it out over time and make sure that it really sticks in. And both of those schools of thought are correct. It's going to be specific to the situation. So batching your tasks together is a highly effective approach to personal productivity. It saves the loss of time and attention that occurs during task switching back and forth. And batching your training together into a short period of time, days, a few weeks, this is also known as mass practice, is shown to be more effective than long-term, less frequent training. It is even better if the task is related to everyday life, incrementally more difficult, and applies constraints that force you to use the skills you develop. This is why immersion is most effective for learning a language. Immersion is a relevant, incremental, and constrained form of mass practice that you can't escape once you're there. Beyond the acquisition of the skill itself, most skills also have a memory component that may benefit from spreading out practice or space repetition. We must be able to recall ideas quickly to reduce demand on working memory, but memory follows a decay curve if not reinforced. So therefore, space repetition and reinforcement is a method of systematic memorization review, emphasizing the things that are difficult to remember. This can be as simple as reviewing flashcards and continuing to review the cards that you miss, but remember that this is vital to overcome that decay of your memory and to recall skills quickly, even ones that you might normally forget. For skills that don't require a fast recall, it's better to skip the flashcards. In that case, just get down to amassing more deliberate practice. Part three, compliance. So far, we've discussed many of the major elements of planning from selecting and scheduling a task for your training, but now we cover the most action-oriented element. How do you get yourself to do the work? How do you submit to the reality of the need for practice? And in the section on preconception about skill acquisition, a crucial point was raised that I keep coming back to, and that is that the biggest barrier to new skills is not talent. It is emotion. How can you put yourself in a position where your emotions will work on your behalf in your quest to acquire a new skill? While some of the things discussed before can help, such as making a schedule, planning a manageable progression, or optimizing 
or the best chance of getting into a flow state, this section will cover the way things outside of yourself can help to affect the state inside of your mind and body to get you over that barrier and into practice. And one of these is Odysseus contracts. This is another idea that I was exposed to by Tim Ferriss, but it goes back to the myth of Odysseus. And Odysseus and his guys, they were tempted by the sirens. They knew that when their boat was passing the call of the sirens, that men who had gone before them ended up crashing their boats into where the sirens were because they heard this sweet singing from the sirens. And it was so tempting that they would end up being lured in and they wouldn't complete their mission. So Odysseus had all of his men put wax in their ears so that they could pass the sirens without hearing them. But Odysseus was different. What he wanted was he wanted to experience the pleasure of hearing the sirens and to live to tell the tale. So he had his men tie him to the mast of his ship. And then as they passed the sirens, he could hear the call of the sirens, experience the pleasure, but also be forced to continue on with his journey. The idea in the Odysseus contract is to similarly tie yourself to the mast and make sure that you move on with your practice, even when you feel other temptation. So here's how this could play out in real life. This is a story of my friend, Kate. Kate, before I knew her in the US Navy, was in a PhD program. She wrote a dissertation and her topic was very interesting. And she got a contract with a book publisher to write a book about the topic of her dissertation. While she was in the Navy, life caught up with her. She got busy and she came to me one day. She's sitting on the couch across from me in my office. And she said, I've got eight chapters left to write, four months to get them done for my publisher and I can't do it. What do I do? This was an election year and Kate was a very political person. So what we decided to do was to have Kate write four blank checks, one check for each of the four months that she had to get her work done. We divided her eight chapters into two chapters per month for four months. And we said that if she did not turn in two chapters per month to me, I would take those blank checks, one of them for each month, and I would send it to the political party that she was most bothered by. She was a very political person. And at first that idea scared her a little bit, but then when she realized how much that would motivate her, how that would be her Odysseus contract, it would really tie her to the mass of getting the work done. She came to me the next morning, she gave me four blank checks and I put them in a folder. And then at the end of each month, probably 11 o'clock, right before the first of the next month, she would send me a document with two chapters to look over and to see that she had done the work. She hit each of those deadlines at the end of each month, She'd come to me at the start of the new month. We'd take out one of the blank checks. She'd get to tear it up, throw it away, feel like she was making progress. And she said that she was writing for America. That was her belief about it, that it was so important that she get that writing done to prevent those blank checks from going to the person she didn't like, that it really pulled her along. That's how you can use an Odysseus contract to assure that you get your own progress along the way with your practice. Another thing you want to do is connect with your body. While we often see many skills, especially cognitive skills as mental feats that are divorced from our bodies, they can often benefit from a connection to our physical being. And in another book I like, The Brain That Changes Itself by Dr. Norman Doidge, he talks about the importance of physical elements in developing new neurons in the brain. So research has shown, at least research that he's written about in that book, that the biggest contributor to the prol proliferation of new neurons in mice is the use of the running wheel. And if you think about that from an evolutionary biology perspective, if we're going out and we're moving, we're moving our bodies, we're going out in different spaces, then it would make sense that we would want to be building new neurons to better understand those new spaces that we're encountering and to form memories of new spaces. So that may be one way that the movement of the body and the health of the body really can stimulate the health of the brain, and in this case, stimulate your learning. So work with your body, take good care of your body, get good exercise, and use that to better enhance your learning process. We can use tools with our learning, but most tools are overrated. So just get those that are necessary to practice efficiently and then move on. The better thing to concentrate on is not adding tools, but removing barriers to your practice. If you must have tools, manage them systematically and keep them simple. In your pre-practice, consider how you will manage your tools and any setup requirements. If you can have things set up before you arrive and keep them that way, then you're already off to a good start. But beware of the intermittent availability of your tools. Perhaps there's a practice field with limited hours or a piece of equipment that you can't own, but you can borrow for a certain time period. 
So spending your willpower upfront to get the details right about those things is going to be really effective early in your process to make sure that you don't deal with the trouble of needing to figure that stuff out every time you go to practice and wasting your energy on dealing with your tools. Your environment can make a world of difference when it comes to learning something new. Again, consider language learning through immersion. This process eliminates all barriers to practice and forces you into the most practical skills with real world consequences in your environment. But of course, immersion tends to require an inordinate sacrifice. So it is often more practical to find ways to take the benefits of immersion without all of the cost. In Deep Work by Cal Newport, which I don't have a copy with me, um, it's a great book though, I highly recommend it. He talks about the perfect work environment. He calls it the eudaimonia machine. And it's not really a machine, it's more of an architectural design. But the idea with the eudaimonia machine is the eudaimonia that's getting at your, your daemon, your genius, is built to work you through a process where at the end of that space that you're moving through, you get down to genius level work. So chamber one of the eudaimonia machine, if you walked in, you'd have to go through them in a line. The first one would be a space where you'd see maybe great work that's been made in this building before, other people's awards, trophies, stuff that would inspire a sense of aspiration and maybe even healthy competition. And then you'd move into the next space, which would be kind of a salon. If you see other people working, talking, drinking coffee, uh, you check in with other people. The next would be a place where there's a librarian, research materials, Wi-Fi, so you can get your computer. But now you're starting to do the stuff of your work. You're starting to gather materials. The fourth space would be a place where you could then start to do the lighter tasks. You could do the work to prep you. You could start putting things together, um, gathering materials, maybe knocking out some emails, checking those last minute details before you go into the fifth and final space, which would be a set where people have individual offices with soundproof gaskets on the door so nobody can bother you. And you could go in there and then you would do your deep genius level, hardest work for blocks of 90 minutes or more and really get in the zone and do your best work. And that by working through that process, Cal Newport says that this could be maybe the best way to get your environment optimized to get you into the most deep and focused work. That's one example of a commitment to working with your environment, eliminating barriers and getting yourself to a place where you can be totally focused. But maybe you don't have the resources to build a eudaimonia machine. That's fine too. Some people just use more of their mind and body as the environment. So they develop um, routines and rituals to clearly mark the beginning and end of their work rather than relying strictly on willpower to just say, okay, I was at my kitchen table eating lunch and now I'm going to put away lunch and totally focus on this work. Uh, I'm going to, you know, stop checking email and social media, even though that's what I've been doing for the last 30 minutes. That's, that's hard to do. It's easier if you have rituals, some sort of way, okay, now I put my phone in airplane mode and put it in the other room. That's my ritual that I know. Other people can take work as a habit uh, to be executed at a certain time of day. So you cue yourself with when it's 9 a.m., that's when I start work every day. Some people, such as professional journalists, can use their years of practice to quickly transition from the distractions of everyday life to a deep state of concentration that's necessary for stretching their abilities. But that takes a lot of practice in and of itself. It's kind of a skill of its own. But if your willpower isn't getting you the results you want, ask yourself some questions about the best way to practice for you. Where is best? How long is best? How will you limit distractions? Asking yourself those questions can optimize your process. And this all may sound a little boring. You might ask, who cares if I'm on my phone between sets of skill practice? But it turns out that this may be more important than it seems at a first glance. There's a lot of research now on the topic of task switching. And when we go from doing something that's deliberate and hard, and then we go and, oh, we'll just check email real quick. I'll just look over here. I'll just check my phone. What we get is something that researchers now call attention residue. It's that the attention that we had to give to the email or the phone has a sort of mental stickiness. We don't quite let go of that completely and come back to the best level of work that we can do. And if we're always making those checks, then we're always getting that residue slathered onto our attention and we're never really experiencing the complete level of attention that we could bring to a situation. So task switching and being away from these distractions is actually extremely important to getting the most out of your practice. In conclusion, if you're interested in learning skills but not sure where to put your energy, 
then check out my last video on examples of the life's task of some of the most skilled people in history. And to learn more about yourself and your unique inclinations, be sure to subscribe to get my next video on Frames of Mind by Howard Gardner. And we talk about the theory of multiple intelligences and understanding what types of intelligence you're most inclined to.